So Brady, now this is the good microphone. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I see we have a, a few visitors here. Some are longtime members visiting. I don't know if we have any visitor visitors here, but I just wanted to point out in the back of the pews a, a blue card. Uh, if you could fill this out, just we have a record of attendance. Um, for those with young children, we have an unattended nursery back here through the doors if you need to take care of a, a crying baby. Um, otherwise, my wife today is uh, covering the, the attended nursery, which is through the door all the way back to the building. Grady's stomping all over me here. It's going to be one of those days, isn't it, Grady? So, uh, without further ado, let's have a prayer, and uh, we'll begin this morning's service. Lord, we come together here in fellowship to worship you in your name, to learn your, your will, that we may apply it in our daily lives. Lord, give us the open mind to hear what the meaning of your words are in today's lesson and that, so that we can apply it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I can yell if I got to. We're going to sing three verses of He's My King to open things up. Mm. All day long of Jesus I'm singing. He's my soul, of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He's my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart, love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my Savior, he's my King. In his light I'm going home to glory. With the souls who trust his saving grace. Going home to sing and tell his story. In the blessed sunshine of his face, he's my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. When this passing world is done, we'll sing three verses of that one as well, and we'll have our second prayer. Mm. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when I stand with Christ on high, Oh, 
once again we come before thy throne in prayer praying father that you'll be with us as we go throughout this service that we center and concentrate fully on what's being done here father we give thee the praise and glory you so richly reserve father we've just celebrated a national holiday of thanksgiving for the physical things that we have and we thank thee father for blessing us with those things but we just pray father we continue to remember each and every day that we must be thankful father each and every day for the spiritual gifts that we have through thee we just pray we continue to put thee first in our lives, Father, so that we set a good example for those we come in contact with. We just pray, Father, through our example we can win more souls to thee. Father, we ask as we come before thee now, we ask a special prayer now on behalf of Katie Bullard and her family. What a tragedy, Father, to carry a baby full term and for it to be born still, still dead and still death. We just pray you'll be with that family, Father, they fully realize that true peace and comfort is in thee, Father. And they turn to thee, Father, not away from thee. We also, Father, ask a special prayer on behalf of Susan, who has failed this morning on her getting ready to come to services this morning on some ice outside her house, and she's at urgent care being taken care of. We just pray that her injuries are minor, Father, and she can be back with us. Also, our brother Don, as he goes before the surgeons tomorrow for knee replacement, Father, we just pray that the surgery will be successful and that he'll have a successful recovery and that it will be quick, Father, not drawn out. Continue to be with us, Father. Our sister Elsie Clark's getting ready to travel and go to Alabama for the winter. We just pray you'll be with her as she travels. Our visitors we have, Father, that are here, we just pray you grant them safe travels as a return home to their places, Father. Continue to be with the many that we have on our prayer list. We know we have those that have lost loved ones. Teresa Lee's lost her mother. Our brother Jeff Overstreet has lost his father. And our sister Donna at the loss of her husband, Roger. Please come for them, Father, and be with them. Continue to guide us now, Father, as we go throughout our lives, that we let your word be first in all that we do. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I come to you at the uh, scripture reading this morning. Please stand if you are able. <coughs> I'll be reading from the New King James Version, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even the blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You may be seated. Good morning. That's a good reading from 2 Peter chapter 1. And if you have your Bibles with you, I know that you do, open to perhaps 
you've got the facing page on the left and the right where you can see the full context of it all. And when you do, you'll agree, I think, with me that it's hard not to see these verses first. Add to your faith knowledge and the knowledge temperance and just going down the list. And you know, of all the things that Peter wrote, of all the things that Peter said, this might be the most <clears throat> memorable and the one that people praise and deservedly so. You know, there are passages of Scripture and all of them ought to fit in their context. We need to pay attention to what's being said just before and just after but there are some passages of Scripture that just stand alone. The Apostle Paul would write to the church at Philippi in chapter 4. And there he would talk about the things that are true and pure. And the things that are lovely. And the things that are of good report. And if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. And we look at that list, and I dare say that somewhere, sometime, you've seen a hanging on the wall. You've seen a meme on the internet. You've seen how that someone lifted out those verses, maybe put a flowery border around it, and it's just a good thought that stays with us. Well, the brackets that we have around verses 5 and 6 and 7 kind of fall in that category too. In the ancient world, there was a literary term that applied, and you and I, we would just call it a list. This world is full of list makers, and then this world is full of people like me that need a list given to me every now and then. And there are lists of bad things. Revelation 21 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And there are other lists of sins. And these are to be avoided. But then there are good lists. And this good list in 2 Peter chapter 1. That's part of our reading this morning. And that's part of our study. But now then, when we look at these few verses, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, as we celebrate those familiar verses, let's remember something, and it's awfully important. And first of all, Notice how the verse immediately following, verse 8, begins. If these things are in you and abound, well, that highlights the importance. But look how the verses themselves begin in verse 5. For this very reason. That's why I'm giving you this list. And you know, this week I looked at Old American Standard, New American Standard, English Standard, Old Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, and almost all of what we would call the mainline accepted translations, the one that almost everyone uses, they begin verse 5 in just that very phrasing, for this very reason. And that's an important phrase because it alerts us to something. Something's going on here. Every now and then we talk to someone. And without precedent, without antecedent, without any setup or warning, they just blurt out something out of the blue. You ever talk to someone, and maybe husbands, you can reference your wife, and wives, I know that you can reference your husband. We're sitting, and we're thinking, and we perhaps say something, and we thought that we had said something before, but we hadn't, and all of a sudden we just say something, and it's just out of the blue. 
Well, that's not the way that we read our Bible. And so Peter is saying, I'm going to give you a list, but there's a reason for it. There's a purpose behind it. I'm not just bouncing off one good thought to another. And you know, it's not just a random chain of thoughts that are popping out here and there. Let me tell you why this is so important. There's a reason for it. And this morning as we look at 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says the reason that you need to follow the guidelines of this list is because I want you to be more godly. And properly understood in its context, you and I would have no problem with saying, I want you to be more godly. Now then, His divine attributes, His eternality, His ability to be anywhere and everywhere all at the same time, His power without limit, His sovereignty that has no boundaries. No, you and I, we're never going to be like God in that respect, but His nature, His goodness, his righteousness. Peter is saying, here are some things to add to your Christian life. Here are some emphases to your Christian walk. And the reason why I'm giving you this list is I want you to be more and more godly in your everyday life. Well, I need that. I need this list more than I do any grocery list that I have in my pocket to pick up something on the way home. I need this list more than any list of honeydews. This is a list that will help me grow not only closer to God, but to be more godly and more righteous in my walk before Him. And I dare say this morning I'm not the only one here that needs this list. I think that we all do, don't we? And another thing that I would want to emphasize as we're looking at the general context of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is trying to emphasize a whole process, a whole network, a whole web, not just one isolated point, but he's saying this is how it all fits together in a system, if you will. You know, our kids early on in school, they might be given a old mason jar, maybe a styrofoam cup that's filled with dirt. They plant a seed and they water it. And then they wait for the first shoot to come up and break the surface. And the teacher is explaining to them how that you can't see it unless you dig it up, but the roots are going down and the shoot is coming up. And it's a wonderful system. There's the beginning of life. A lot of you I know, you've bought a house or you've sold a house. And there's a process in it. You know, you can buy an old junker car when you're a teenager. And you're out there on the curb and you give him the money and he signs the title and you take it down to the motor division and that's pretty much it. Make sure it's insured, of course. And then do you remember when you bought your first house and how there was a stack of papers that high and you had to sign every one. The ones that you didn't sign, you had to initial. And there was an inspection that had to take place. And there's a lot of things that go into buying a house or even selling a house. And it's a process. It's a system. And you've got to walk through it all. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 1, 
Peter is detailing what I like to call putting it all together. And that's the challenge of our Christian life. When we come up from the waters of baptism, we are washed from our sins. We have the Spirit of God. We have the leading of God, the guidance of God. We have the prayers and best wishes of those who love us most. We have examples set before us to follow. But the journey doesn't end there, does it? And we go on step by step, Day by day, year by year, Peter is writing to a people of God that were persecuted, that were troubled, that were outnumbered, that were very much in a minority, just like you and me today. He's writing to a people that sometimes found it hard to model the example of Jesus in them, just like you and I today. And Peter is emphasizing it's not that there's a moment of arrival and it's a split second after our baptism. Peter is emphasizing that there's a walk, there's a way, there's a process, and there are steps to be taken. And if we look at 2 Peter chapter 1 down through about verse 15 or so, and you can see that Peter goes back and forth between these obvious points. Here's what we were. Here's what we are now. But praise God, here's what we're going to be one of these days if we keep on that Christian walk and we follow that process. Every one of us we're somewhere in that picture. And our spiritual odyssey is our own. And you know, I wish it was just as neat and simple as that chart. Most of us, we kind of take a step or two ahead and then what happens? We get knocked back a step. We take a step or two ahead and what happens? We get knocked down flat. Have to get up. Start again. That's what life is. And Peter is not unaware of that. He's not in denial over that truth. But he's saying that as we come and we give ourselves to the Lord, there's a growing, there's a stretching, there's a reaching, and there's a whole process in our spiritual life. And just looking at how Peter outlines this, in our past, he talks about in verse 4, there was the corruption that was in our lives. And one translation I think it's the NIV, it may be another. Too many translations to keep up with sometimes. Instead of the word corruption, it uses the word depravity. And depravity is kind of one of those non, no-nonsense words, isn't it? Paul in Galatians chapter 1, talks about those who declare another gospel. And he says they have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the old King James. And you know, when you talk to someone and you give the impression that you think someone or something is somehow perverted or depraved, well, that's kind of a hard selling point in 2023. Maybe that's been a hard selling point in every year, in every century. But here Peter is saying, this is who we are. This is who we were without Jesus. But we've come out of that corruption, that depravity that is in the world. And Jesus has washed us clean because our old sins, our 
former sins. There in verse 9, washed away by the blood of Jesus. A few moments ago, when we had that arrow stretching across the top of the monitor, and we pointed out that all of us are somewhere on that spiritual path, that spiritual journey. Well, to look back and realize that we were lost in our sins. Thank God. One person was quoted as saying, and if you go to the internet to try to find out who it was, you'll find hundreds of different suggestions. It's one of those good quotes, and it's kind of gone into the public domain. Anybody can say it. Everybody says it. Thank God. I'm not what I was. And thank you. I'm not what I will be. Peter says there was our past. But now he says in our presence, verse 1, we have obtained. We've been given. Some translations have it. We have received. We have escaped that corruption that is in the world. Verse 1, there's a precious faith and we share it with others of God's children. God has called us, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's what we used to be. But look where God has brought us and where we stand now. Have you had experience? Have you been around? Children and maybe they're from an abusive background. And it's a pitiful thing that tugs at our heart. Sometimes they don't look you right in the eye. Sometimes they have those behavior problems. Because how off their upbringing has been to that point in time. And they're fragile. And they've been shattered. And you know, hard treatment does that to even the hardest of people. Now you think about the saints that Peter was writing to. In the minority, in the Roman Empire where they had to perhaps nominally go through the process and doing the trade guilds and selling in the marketplace, where Caesar's image and the worship of idol gods was everywhere just in order to live, and how beaten down they were, they were a persecuted people. And yet Peter is trying to fill them with hope and courage. Look where we are now. Jesus has raised us up. He's able to lift us up. There's an old world that we've escaped. And there's a new state. There's a new life. A new beginning that we've come into. And then Peter tries to get them to see that the best is yet to be. And there are better days ahead. There in verse 4, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Every now and then we point out a Greek word. Kevin and I, we try not to go too heavy in it because we very quickly get in over our heads when we try to do that. But we sometimes point out those words that everybody knows, or maybe everyone should know. And the word here for partakers is that word koinonia. Camp koinonia. Pikes Peak region people. We're familiar with the Christian Bible camp for our kids in the summer. And koinonia is that word for fellowship. It's for sharing. It's a family word. It's a community word. And notice what Peter is saying. There's a process to be played out. There's a path to follow. You can become more God-like in your behavior and in your righteousness and you can share 
in the heavenly nature. The best is indeed yet to be. And then notice how that Peter says in verse 11, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the kingdom of God. I know some good people and every time they read the word kingdom in the New Testament, well that's the church. Kingdom and church, one and the same. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. It's not here. Peter's writing to those who were already in the church. He's not saying now then one of these, if you become more godly in your living, you'll be added to the church. That happened back after their baptism. Peter is saying the kingdom here. It's the fullness of God's reign. It's the worthies who lived before Jesus. It's those who will live after this generation is passed over. It's when God will embrace all of His people from all over the world, from all time. He's talking about that eternal kingdom. And Peter says, if you look at this list, and not in the sense of just checking it off, add to your faith, knowledge. Well, I'm going to read a chapter a day. I'm going to follow the Pikes Peak daily Bible reading schedule. That's always a good idea. But he's not talking about doing it in the sense of checking off a list but he's saying if you're adding to your faith these qualities day by day, there's coming a time when doors will be thrown wide open. Well done. Good, faithful servant. You've done well in these few things. I will make you over many enter into the joy of your Lord. Peter says that's what God has in store for us. Go to the internet, Google it if you want to, and type in 2 Peter chapter 1, or maybe add to your faith that particular phrase, and see how many people have charted, have made a graph, made a diagram, and there are they're all remarkably similar. Some of them, on the internet, they have the names of the author. There at the bottom or the side. Some of them are copyrighted. I don't know how you do that when you're lifting verses out of Scripture, but that's okay. I chose this one because there wasn't so much any information on it, but it shows just exactly what all the others are saying. And it's an attempt to illustrate the process, the journey, the walk of faith, of drawing closer and closer to God and becoming more and more godly in our behavior and our character. And there are steps, if you please. I don't know if that's literally so. You know, we've got steps here. And... You know, once you come down, you're down. And once you come up, it's a finished action. I don't know if there's a finished action ever to growing in knowledge. I don't know if we ever conclude and we reach the full limit of the patience that we can acquire. I don't know if any of these are like a glass and we can fill it full of water and you can't put any more in. It's not that kind of a list. And it's not that kind of an accomplishment. But as you add to your faith, more and more, to become sharers in the divine nature and have that abundant, that wide open entrance to the kingdom of God and the vindication of all the righteous, you hear the expression sometimes, trust the process. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Well, just trust the process. You've got the book. You've got the manual. You've got the instructions. 
And there it is spread all over the floor in a zillion parts. And I don't think I can do this. Well, just trust the process. Follow the directions. It'll all come together. Peter's writing to saints, folks just like you and me. People sometimes struggling in their walk with the Lord, just like you and me. Well, what can I do? What do I need to do? Well, Peter says, let me give you a list of sorts. And it's common sense. And it's not just for beginning Christians, it's for seasoned, mature Christians as well. It's for all of us. Grow our faith. And grow closer to God. Our lesson this morning ends with just one simple question. It's not so much an easy question. But are you growing in your faith? In your knowledge? In your patience? In your generosity? In your hospitality? Are you growing in these qualities that we see in Jesus who lived in the flesh and as these develop in us brings us ever closer and nearer to our God? This morning we offer a song of encouragement. Maybe you would ask prayers for help, for encouragement. Maybe there's come a time in your life when you need to get up and start all over again. Maybe this is the time this morning that you would begin this walk and put on our Lord in baptism. This morning, if there's a way that we can help, any way that we can help, why not let us know now while we stand and sing together? <coughs>
Supper, we'll sing two verses of all the depths and the riches. Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me There the death for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary Oh, the depth of such wonderful love Flowing down the simple and free and the day for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today when I think of his agony. By his stripes I am free from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless, simple, and free. And the death for my sins was all paid, in his suffering on Calvary. everyone have the elements of the Lord's Supper, the cup and the, and the wafer? If not, if you'd raise your hand, a gentleman will bring you one. No one? I'm going to read from Luke chapter 22, two short verses really, starting in verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, that's the apostles or disciples at that time, of course, saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And so, verse 19 tells us that when we partake of this, this bread, this uh, small uh, bit of bread, that we are partaking of the body of Christ that died for us. Would you all pray with me, please? Good Father in heaven, how we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, what he was willing to do for us. Just moments from the beginning of the uh, beatings and the persecution and, and finally the cross, Father. Jesus takes time to... Uh, be, institute this this ceremony we call the Lord's Supper and father we thank you for this bread which will represent the body of Christ which was broken for us we thank you father for his sacrifice we thank you for the relationship that covenant that we have with him and father we thank you and in, in his name amen Let us consider now verse 20. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Covenant is not a complicated word to understand. If you go to a dictionary, a Bible dictionary, or a, 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 a Merriam-Webster, it simply means agreement. An agreement between two parties. Another translation is a contract. One party does one thing and another party does another. And so this, the fruit of the vine of which we're about to partake represents that relationship we have Christ, that covenant with Christ, that covenant that he gave his life for us and in return we worship him and we follow him and we attend and participate in the church that he left for us. Would you all pray with me please? Father, may we live a life that reflects a covenant relationship with you, Father. We're certainly not perfect, in fact, the Lord's Supper reminds us, Father, of what Christ did for us and how we fall short. But we thank you, Lord, for the blood he was willing to shed for us. 
We thank you that it brings us, Father, in your, in your presence, redeemed of our sins. And Father, may we live the covenant relationship you would have us to lead. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. one more verse of this song before we uh, have a prayer for the collection. Mm. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free, through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, Flowing boundless, simple, and free. And the day for my sins was obeyed in his suffering on Calvary. It's now time to consider our offering as the slide depicts. There are various ways to give, and our members know those ways that we might uh, might give to the work of this church. I'll read a little from uh, uh, Acts chapter 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. And then going down to verse 36, we're introduced to Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Don't we now, in our weekly giving, present our offering at the feet of Jesus Christ? That's our role each week, to take that which he has so generously shared with us and to give back to the Lord that which he deserves for the continuation of the work of this church, particularly the help of the needy and poor. Would you all pray with me, please? Father, we thank you again for the abundance of blessings you've given us. Father, we may, as, as, as Joseph, known as Barnabas, uh, be willing, Father, to sacrifice financially, Lord, that others may partake of, of our bounty, that the work of this church may continue, that, Father, we may be representatives of your, your love and your, your, your church here on this earth. And, Father, we thank you again for all the ways you bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. more song. We'll sing two verses of this and then we'll have a wrap up. <coughs> Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to him in Change my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. What a joy twill be when I wake to see him for whom my heart is. Never more to sign 
nevermore to die for that day my heart is yet me how it changed my cross for a sorry crown where the gates swing outward never at its feet I lay every burden down and with Jesus reign Father, this is the time of year where we get to be with family and with friends and with loved ones. Father, we get to enjoy all the wonderful things that there is in this life as we get to celebrate these holidays with our families. We know that we have love for one another, that we have respect for one another, that we care about one another. But Father, we would be remiss if we didn't realize that beyond all this holidayness beyond all that we see is is a God is a God who has love for each and every one of us that is so vast that it really cannot be described we know that you sent your son and our Savior Jesus the Christ so that we could have a hope of eternal life but father your love is absolutely astounding and amazing because it has there are no words then you give us your mercy and your patience and your kindness. Father, you give us health in this life. We know it's going to be short, but you give us the health that we can to enjoy this life, to take advantage of all the things that you've, you've given us, to use our skills, our mind, our heart, to learn of you, to love you, and to serve you. We know, Father, that through your word that we have to realize that it's about you and it was never about us. That if we choose to be the center of our own life and that everything has to be our way, then we've missed everything because you are the center of all things. You must take precedence in our lives in every way. Father, whether we're sick, whether we're well, whether we're rich, whether we're poor, whether we have everything or we have nothing, we still have to be thankful to you for life in and of itself. We know, Father, that we will stand before your Son and give an account for what we've done in this life. And we pray, Father, that you would give us the spiritual wisdom, the maturity and the understanding to realize that you already know everything. You already know all the motives. You already understand exactly what each and every one of us has done and why we did it. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to have a mindful heart to repent, to change, to love, and to serve you, and to live according to the will the best we can. We know that we will fall. We know that we will fall short. But we are so thankful for the blood of your Son. We pray for our extended families, wherever they may be, that you would hold them tightly in your hand, that you would allow truth to prevail in every situation. Guide this leadership in this land and the world. Help them to understand that you are the God of heaven and that all knees will bow and all knees will confess that you are the God, the one and only God. Father, guide us, protect us, give us the healings that we need, especially the heart, not just the body, so that we would love you and serve you in the way we interact with one another and those who are even against us. We pray all these things, Father, as we pray for the forgiveness of our sins in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.